Our guest today is uh, Dr. Warren Davis. He's the first uh, PhD in creativity from with the advisor of the man who wrote the book on creativity that we read already. Um, um, Mike Csikszentmihalyi. So he's also he's a he's a really brilliant guy, a great teacher. So we're really lucky to have him. He's a professor, consultant, done a lot of things, even in his short life thus far. Um, one more little announcement about the program: there are some tickets available for students to Eastern State Penitentiary's Terror Behind the Walls. So if you're interested in that, um, come see Chris, and he can, he can give you one. Okay, so without further ado, Orrin Davis. So imagine it's been a long day for everybody. I know everybody wants to eat, but I want to actually kick this off with a little exercise. I want to give you guys uh, some idea of how teamwork goes. What do we got on here? I got about, uh, got about, all right, so I want to get people in groups of about six or seven. So everybody gather around in groups of about six or seven. Um, you can stand or you can sit either way, but groups of about six or seven. Okay. Uh, is that going to work? Six or seven? Introduce yourselves. Once you find your group, introduce yourselves just by giving your name and one random fact about yourself. And since you guys are likely all in the same class, one random fact that you don't think anybody else knows yet. I'm sending you two back there. behind your back through this entire exercise. Now this exercise is a little bit tricky to think. All right, one late comer, why don't you just join a group here, uh, introduce yourself quickly, and give one fact about yourself that you think they don't know. Oh, everyone has 
say it. Everyone has to say a number. You can't say a second number until everybody said one. Oh, I think it's okay. seen seven. Okay. enough people, you had more than 10 people, I think, in your group. So we fell into a pattern of skipping every person, and that just lent itself to going around, and we had an odd number of people, so we didn't know that. And also, eye contact helped, like, we started making eye contact. I'm sorry? Eye contact. Yeah, no. yes, you started making eye contact, started find find some way to communicate with one another. So the team that found it difficult, what was difficult about it? Okay, so the team that had difficulty, I mean, the first thing is, didn't seem clear as to what you were supposed to do or how you were supposed to do it. It almost seems like just a whole bunch of balls got thrown at you without even knowing what's going on. Or like, you, you know that you're supposed to reach this goal, but you're not quite sure how. Doesn't it sound like a lot of the management you deal with on a pretty constant basis? That's the problem that we get with teamwork in business a lot of the time. You just get a whole bunch of balls thrown at you, and here's what you're supposed to do with them. Now, go ahead and get it done. Oh, by the way, there are a whole bunch of restrictions. Make sure you don't violate any of those. Go. And you have, you may not even know each other. You may just end up this ad hoc team. You didn't know you were going to get thrown together, but well, here you are. And that's what I want to address today, is what do you do with that? Once you've got this ad hoc group, what are you supposed to do? Now, when we talk about teams in business, even though these are ad hoc teams, I want to at least make sure that we're all on the same page. I'm actually going to define a team. Now, the definition I use comes from Captain Mack and Smith, and they say a couple things. The first is, teams are small. In general, we're not talking more than 10, 15 people. 15 would be an extremely large team, I would say. So, small groups. Um, you want to be working on something that one person can't do alone. I mean, if you can all do it by yourselves, why do you need a team? Or if you're all going to do this in tandem, again, that's not a team. That's a whole bunch of people doing the same thing in tandem. What you're looking for is something that requires complementary skills. Something you can't do by yourself, something your partner can't do by himself or herself. And it's going to take a whole bunch of people to actually make this happen. If you can actually build enough complements, you get a level of synergy. We'll talk a little bit more about synergy later. But most importantly, a group's got a common purpose. There's a shared goal. We're all trying to get to the same point, and that guides everybody's actions. And there are performance goals and accountability. So you have some idea of whether or not you're actually making it towards the goals, whether or not you're achieving all the relevant goals, whether or not you're actually doing what you're supposed to do. And if you've got basically those four things, you've got a team. Uh, how often do you guys actually come across a team? Because they call it a team. But who actually comes across that when you're told that you're on a team? It's not nearly as often as people think. But a lot of that is because the, the bottom three things are missing. Usually, you've got a small group, but they don't necessarily check to see if the skills are complementary. They don't necessarily check to see that everybody's actually got the same agenda. And in many cases, nobody really knows whether or not you're doing it right. The only thing you know is you're done, or you're not done, or we're here and we need to be there, and well, we're going to all have to figure out how to get there, I guess. This is what happens a lot of the time. This is the difficulty of ad hoc. So how do we go from ad hoc to adroit, which is what I'm going to talk about here. So here's the thing, like business teams generally thrown together. Sometimes you get complementary skills, if you're lucky. Um, did you ever notice they never match with personality? You know There's always like that one, those one or two people that you just don't seem to get along with quite so well. And of course, 
It's never the same people at the same level in the company. You get like, you know, a vice president here, a director here, a couple rank and file here, a little bit of middle management here. You always, you always get a this really broad mix of people. And in many cases, you get a leader you didn't pick yourself. So they just throw a push the leader on you and, uh, okay, yeah, guys, all right, get it done. All right, well, how are you going to get it done? Well, first thing is, you got to know the pitfalls. So here's what they are. The first one is involuntary participation. You may have to be on this team. You may not have a choice about this. You just decide. So it's often good if you want to get by it, if you actually want to get anything done, if you at least acknowledge the fact that not everybody wanted to be here in the first place, but, well, newsflash, we're all here. We have to be here. So at least acknowledge the elephant in the room if you think you need to. Uh, look out for the management, because sometimes they've torpedoed your team and you don't even realize it. They hand you deadlines that you may not have anticipated, or you're in an environment that's really not conducive to working for teams. Um, you've got to deal with a whole bunch of ethos. You've got to deal with office politics, and when you're thrown on a team, especially an ad hoc team, you may not even know what politics are floating around. You may be with people in sales, and you have no idea what the politics are in sales. So you may have been sent somebody who was set up to fail, brought on your team because they thought your team was going to fail, and you walked into this from a completely different division, you had no idea this was going to happen. And, of course, there's a competitive reward structure. You know, you all need to work on a team, but, you know, the person who does the best job is the only person who's going to get the rewards. You've probably seen this happen quite a bit, too. So why? Um, it's expected that everybody is going to contribute equally, as if you all have the same skill level to start with. Generally not. Um, and then, of course, you have problems like shared language and understanding. Often people are coming from different departments. You've got your own jargon. You've got your own terms. So you may even have different levels of management. You may have some managers, you may have some leaders, and you may have people at all different levels of the company. So there's a lot of confusion as to who means what when they say what. Who's used to giving orders? Who's used to taking orders? And who's actually in a position to speak up? Who's willing to speak up? Who's not willing to speak up? You know, that, that very quiet person sitting over there in the corner who hasn't said a darn thing, um, they're on that team for a reason. Do you know what it is? Because if they don't know what it is either, you're never going to get anything out of that person. And ironically, that may be the, skilled, the most skilled person in the room. So before I start talking about the solutions to these pitfalls, and before I start talking about how to turn ad hoc into a droid, let me run through a couple things. Just the elements of the room. What I'm going to lay out for you is pretty simple stuff. It's pretty obvious. And when you're looking at this, well, yes, this is all obvious. Like, yeah, we know. And for a lot of the things I'm going to point out, you're going to be like, yes, we know. We know we're supposed to do that. So how come you don't? Right? I may be pointing out the obvious, but I'm also pointing out that if this is so obvious, how come nobody does it? And there are two reasons why not. The first one is you've got people who are juggling balls. If you look at management or most people in a company, they're juggling 18, 20 balls. It's insane what kinds of workloads people are getting these days. You're hearing about, you know, 60 is the new 40, as far as workload goes. So when you're juggling that many balls, why can't we do all of this? So what I'm going to point out to you is, you have to do all of this. Don't tell me you don't have time to. You don't have time not to. And in many cases, some of these things are so blindingly simple that people just overlook them. And that's the other thing that you're going to find, is that some of these solutions, they're just blindingly simple and people go right past them. And by the way, just because they're simple to describe doesn't mean they're easy to execute. I mean, how many times have you had a goal right in front of you and, all, and you said to yourself, all i got to do is just do it. That, I know what I need to do, now let's just do it. And then nothing happens. Right? Nothing. Yeah, and you're like, this is so easy. If it's so easy, how come it hasn't been done? If you know exactly how to do it, why haven't you done it? And that's what happens. So, what I'm going to say specifically is when I lay all this out for you, I'm going to say, do all of it. Don't do some of it. Don't skip steps. Don't say, you know, well, we don't have time or we're too busy because the rest of this is, let me, let me ask you almost the counterfactual. Are you too busy to fail? Are you too busy to have to do this again? Or if you're so busy, do you want to do this again? Do you want to have to worry about whether or not you're going to fail? You have to worry about whether or not team politics or all sorts of um, goals at cross purposes are going to torpedo your team. And if you're not worried about that, well, hey, by all means, 
go skip these steps. But most teams are pretty worried about that. And most teams go down because of many of the pitfalls that I've mentioned. So here's how you get around them, but you actually have to take all the steps. So the first thing, and I will say that this, I would say, is acceptable only for a long-term team. If you guys are just there for the afternoon, or like maybe an hour or two, yeah, maybe you can skip the serious introductions. But otherwise, these work out very well. Serious introduction, give your name, give your position, and tell a story about yourself at your best. Now, whenever I raise this suggestion, people say, well, well that's bragging. You know, I, I don't want to brag about myself. Um, is, it, is it really bragging if you're all doing it? You're all trying to get up to a level, and in a certain sense, you're introducing yourself with your values, with the things that you care about. And you're going to learn a lot about people, about how they define their best. And that'll help you to work with them. Because in a very real sense, you're understanding what they value, what they aim for, what kinds of goals they have. Remember, if you have to work with this person, you're going to have to build shared goals with each and every one of those people. Probably a good idea to get to know how they think, how they operate, what are they up to. And like I said, when you're all telling these stories, you're not bragging because you're all showing yourself at your best. So there's a collective best that's being established here. And I think that the most amazing thing, whenever I have people do serious introductions, I think the thing that amazes everybody is the level of awesomeness in the room. In all seriousness, when, and I, I've seen this, you know, I even do this in some of my classes where, where I lecture, and I've had people give serious introductions. You work with amazing people, and you never knew it. And as you start sharing these stories, especially when people give really good serious introductions that really tell you something about themselves, you walk out of that room, you know, after your first session, like, oh my god, I never knew I worked with such incredible people. So build that. And as you build that, you're also building a degree of mutual respect. Because when you're all walking out of there saying, I work with some incredible people, it's very hard to look down your nose at somebody that you think is incredible. And it's very hard to get on somebody's case if they're not performing at the level that you were hoping when you know how incredible that person is from the get-go. So it builds familiarity, it builds respect, it actually builds credibility, and it actually gets the team, to a certain degree, on the same page. And like I said, if you've got an hour or two, you don't have time for this. But most teams do not convene for only an hour or two. Establish the goals. Again, this is one of those deceptively simple things. What are we here to do? And yet, as I point out, just from that number exercise, that's not so simple, is it? I mean, nominally, all you had to do was count to 10. So you say, that's the goal. That's not the goal. It's, the goal was not to count to 10. The goal was to count to 10 within the restrictions you were given. And you had to know what those restrictions were. What were all the parameters? That wasn't clear to everybody. In, in one of the teams, that wasn't clear to everybody. When it's not clear to everybody, knows that one of the teams didn't actually meet the goal because it wasn't clear. And if I asked you from the get-go, is that a clear goal? If I, asked, if I asked teams, what is the goal here? Generally, the answer I get is, count from 1 to 10. See, we can all establish goals. This is what happens. We establish goals by saying everybody has to count to one to, from 1 to 10. In other cases, by the way, you see people establishing goals with lots of jargon. So maybe half the team understands what the goal is, but the other half the team doesn't. So there's, there's actually a heck of a lot of confusion and a surprising amount of confusion about what the team's goal is. So it's actually worthwhile to make sure that everybody understands exactly what the goal is, exactly what the parameters are. And you'll be surprised as you go around the room, just to make sure that everybody understands the goal, you'll be surprised how many times people don't actually agree on what the team's there to do and how we're supposed to do it, and how we're going to hold each other accountable to, for how we're going to do it. All of this stuff, not in agreement. And if your conception of the goal is different from somebody else's conception of the goal, then person A is working toward one thing, you're working towards something else, and you can imagine what happens when this is ten people, each of whom has a different idea of the goal, or even if there are just six different ideas of the goal among ten people three different ideas of the goal among 10 people, 
you're still not all working toward the same thing. You just think you are. And that's when things start going wrong. And have you ever noticed that when things go wrong in a group, you say, well, but we're supposed to do this. No, we're supposed to do that. No, we're supposed to do this. We're supposed to do that. Question. Do you have a question? Do you want a question? Yeah, I don't mind questions. Yeah, I mean, especially for creativity, sometimes the goals are not all that, you know, clear or at least that. You can't make them that explicit, like, for example, a jazz band. You know, it's very, very clear. I, I, I think it's quite difficult to make that exactly clear. And even in jazz, you've got certain parameters that are there and that are established by the group. You have the instruments that are there. So you know which instruments are there. You know roughly, you generally don't just get up and play with a jazz ensemble. You usually practice together. So you have some knowledge right. of the people I'm you can work with. Right. I know about the goal in particular, you know, clear, a clear goal. It's, it's, that seems kind of difficult. It can be. And when you're trying to be creative, you may want to leave some room for creating the goal. But just for example, if you want to say that the goal was to reinvent the wheel, <coughs> There's a lot of room for that. Reinvent the wheel. And in many cases, you have to get together and define the problem. And in some cases, what you may say is, our first goal is actually to define what our problem is. So how are we going to define the problem? Really, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to invent a better means of transportation that works with magnets. No, that's not really our goal. We need to, get, we need to know how to get from point A to point B with point A and point B being close together. As you know, as our goal, and so in that back and forth, maybe you're maybe you're actually defining the problem, and once you've got a problem, then the problem becomes the goal, or defining the problem becomes the goal, and everybody's working on defining the problem. So, I don't know if that covers your question, because I, I would say that there's a difference between defining the problem and establishing the goal, because a goal could be to define a problem, or a goal could be to set parameters, um, and I understand this could get a little bit meta to the point that you're. Setting the, setting the parameters for determining the question, which will set the parameters for determining the solution, but each one of those steps could be an individual goal. Does that make sense? Um, one of the other things is to determine stakeholders and their needs. Because who's actually, who wants this to happen? I mean, do all of you actually want this goal to succeed? Do you guys actually want to meet this goal? And who's going to use this when you're done, who wants this from your team? Because in some cases, that'll help you figure out exactly what the goal should be, is to think about who are the stakeholders. Because in a lot of cases, you, know, you get banded together, you're given this assignment, and then you're kind of scratching your heads, who's this for? I mean, I know we're all convened here, but who's actually going to use this thing that we're all making, or, or this result that we're trying to get to? Um, who actually cares? Why is this important? And in some cases, you need that motivation. You don't want to just be sitting there spinning your wheels or dealing with whatever management has handed you. You want to know why. You want a meaning for this. So all of those things are inherent in the establishment of the goals. So this, again, one of those things sounds simple, not so much. So an important thing to do is make sure that every single person in the room has the same conception of the goal. And once you've got that down, make sure everybody buys into the goal. Because that doesn't happen either. A lot of the times, if you look around, and especially if I could you know, go in there, like one of those reality shows where you go talk to everybody secretly and you get the secret interview with them, you'd be surprised to find out how many people have their own agenda on this project. Right? They come in there and they say, yeah, I understand what the goal is. I've also got my own goal. I've got my own personal agenda that I'm not telling anybody about. And, right? You ever seen this? And you encounter this midway through the project, right? Somewhere, somewhere along the lines of the project, you discover somebody else has an agenda. And they've got their own reasons for doing this, or they're trying to accomplish something completely independent with this. You need to find out what that is immediately. Do not wait until you're midway through the project to discover, oh, somebody else has an agenda here. You do not want that happening. So find out if there are other agendas. And make sure that those are aligned with the group. And there are ways to do that. Because you can find out what each person's individual goals are and find out how those contribute to the group goal. Now you say, well, if people have their own agendas, they're not going to want to admit it. Right? This is the point you've got to make to them. If one, if one of us fails, we all fail. And if we all fail, you fail. So if we don't achieve our goal, you don't achieve your goal. 
And there is almost, I hate, to, I hate to discuss even implied threats, but it's sort of a matter of if you torpedo us, you're going down with the ship. So play nice because you're going to go down too if you, ha if you make a problem. And this is when everybody realizes that they've got to speak up because we are all in the same boat. And that's something that you've got to very clearly establish for the group. We're all in this boat together. So if anybody tries sabotage, whoever does it goes right down with us. On the flip side, if everybody's working to make this happen, we can all get what we want. That also means, incidentally, that if you find a competitive reward structure, get rid of it and fire with both barrels. No competitive reward structures at all. Either we all win as a team, or we all lose as a team, but if there's a competitive reward structure in place, forget it. People are going to have their own agenda, and look, you know, at that point, don't try pretending this is a team. This is every man for himself, and so you might as well acknowledge that elephant in the room. If you want teamwork, we win as a team, or we lose as a team. That's it. And to tell you the truth, it doesn't matter how many stars you have on a team, if the score, if the team still has the lower score, that team still loses. So everybody put in, everybody understand, whatever your goals are, feel free to admit to them. We, we can all try and work together to make sure that everybody wins, both individually and as a team. You absolutely have to make that alignment of everybody's individual goals with the team. One of the reasons why this works is because, again, people have got egos. And when you're dealing with people that have egos on a team, one of the reasons why they've got that ego that, is that they've got their own agenda. And most of the time, you find that egos, they, they've got their own agenda. And part of the reason you're seeing all that ego is the agenda. The agenda that that individual has. And especially if they're not willing to admit to it, that's when you know you've got to work. So make sure that it's clear to everybody that we're all in the same boat, we've all got to accomplish this, and we can make you a winner. Like if, the, if there's a particular way in which you want to win for yourself, let's see if we can include that. Let's see if we can make that happen for you right along with the rest of us winning. That sounds good. And it's especially good when you can get into a mutual back scrubbing round of like, you know, well, this person's going to scrub that person's back, this person's going to scrub that person's back, and everybody's back's getting scrubbed. Oh, and by the way, we're all going to pull this off anyway. And if, we, and if we've got this all going, it's this great little group of everybody wins. But it's important to realize, everybody wins or nobody wins. Keep the talent happy. This is very important because people come in there, it's an ad hocracy, and everybody's got their own skills. Well, what are those skills? Like, you know, take inventory. And in many cases, people do take inventory, but they take the most cursory inventory. What are you here to do? That's not the question. That is absolutely not the question. The question is not, what are you here to do? The question is, what can you do? There's a big difference between the two, and often a world of difference between the two. Because if you just come in and do exactly what you're assigned to do, could end up having to do things that are outside of your skill set, or things that you're not as good at as somebody else in the room. Not only that, you may end up doing things that you don't really enjoy doing. So here you are, you're stuck with a whole bunch of tasks that you don't like to do, you're not particularly good at doing, or certainly you're not the best person in the room to be doing it, and meantime, somebody else probably has the same issue. Wouldn't it be great if you two would just switch? So when you take inventory, find out what can everybody do? What does everybody want to do? Who's good at what? And for that matter, who's willing to work on what? And make sure that you've got a complementary skill set. Make sure you've actually got on this team all the skills that you need to get this done. Because the last thing you want to find out is that there's a week before the deadline, and uh, oh darn, we're missing some skills on this team because oh, nobody knows how to do that. Uh, hey management, could you get us some now everybody's tied up? Now what are you going to do? So you actually have to think about this all in advance. When you take that inventory and actually take the inventory, and this taking the inventory actually covers you in case you discover that there are skill sets you're missing. Either somebody may have time to develop them, or you can contact management and say, look, we're going to need this. Not today, not tomorrow, but two weeks down the line. We're going to need somebody who can join us who can do this. Or we're going to need to be able to farm out this task to somebody who can make this happen for us and send us back the product in 48 hours. 
or over the weekend, can you set us up with, uh, with something like that? And incidentally, that's a lot of what management and leadership on Teams is for, is actually running all the interference and interfacing with the rest of the organization. Probably get to that during the class as opposed to uh, just this dinner talk. And once again, going back to the idea that everybody wins, this has got to be something that is meaningful and beneficial to everybody. Now, a lot of times people end up on the work team and they're going, oh darn. I'm here, and I don't really want to be here. I'm, I want to be somewhere else. I want to be doing something else. And, they don't, and, and they're just like beside themselves, and half the time, they're keeping that to themselves. So you don't even know. And it's those things that you don't know that can end up exploding partway through the teamwork. So those, that's why you want to get that all out right away. As you take that inventory, what's everybody's agenda? What does everybody want to do? How does everybody want to benefit from this project? How can everybody benefit from this project? But more importantly, what ensures that this project is meaningful to everybody? Because think about this, I'm sure every last one of us in this room has worked on a project that absolutely has had zero meaning to them. Right? Uh, I'll give you a personal example. I was thrown on a team, uh, my background is in neuroscience, psychology, chemistry, and I ended up in a project having to do with the mining industry. This has nothing to do with anything I've ever done. But I had a coworker who was a pretty smart cookie, and she said to me, you know, look, Oren, um, I understand you're not big on the mining industry, but think about this. We're designing a report for a client. When the client uses our report, that client, that client is going to be creating jobs in third world countries, developing the infrastructure of that country, creating jobs in that country, Stimulating the economy of a third world country. Well, that I can buy into. That I'm willing to work on. And that I'm willing, to, that I'm willing to, to do. And suddenly this project just became meaningful for me. With just a slight revamp of what the goals of the project are. I mean, yes, I understand that this is the report I need to put out. I understand that this is what the client needs. But I've got my own reasons for doing it. Now, I'm, now I have bought in to the group shared goal. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on this report as hard as I can, knowing that my contributions to this report are stimulating economies overseas. Now, when you've got people who don't want to be there, what reasons can you give them? What motivates them? By the way, in those serious introductions, you will get clues to that. As you listen to people talk, you get a sense of their values, what's meaningful to them. And that can help you reframe the project for people that have not bought in immediately, for people that don't feel like they get it or they feel like they really want in on this right away, that reframing helps a lot. Now, many of you, uh, yeah, question. Sorry to interrupt you. Sure. Uh, just a quick question. Chronologically speaking, do you think this would be more beneficial at the front end to perhaps waylay some of the internal politics that you're discussing, some of the more personal goal type aggression that you're describing, do you think it would be better to establish this meaningful benefit prior to it can be. It can be, but it may also depend on like who's going to need to use which skill sets. So you may discover that you know one person on a team is the only person with the skill set that we need, but that person doesn't really want to do this, or that person hasn't really bought in. But you don't find this out until you get to the skill sets. So these things certainly overlap with one another, and you could probably do these in general in any, in any order that you know, makes sense. But you certainly have to go through all of them. So, is that, is that covered? Yes, yes, yes. You certainly have to go through all of them, not necessarily in that order. Now, many of you may have heard of Amadi Lane Kramer's progress principle. The idea is that some of the best engagement at work comes when we make progress. We need to know that we're moving forward. We need to know that we're actually getting somewhere. Because one of the most frustrated things, uh, Amadi Lane Kramer in their study found that one of the most frustrating things for people is the recognition that they're spinning their wheels and feeling like they're spinning their wheels and getting nowhere. And if you think about it, some of the most frustrating moments at work, I'm not getting anywhere, or I can't get anywhere. Where the path forward's blocked, I can't make progress. So think about how you can make progress as a team. Establish a workflow. Who's going to do what? When? How is this being coordinated? What are the timelines? And incidentally, is this, is this a one-session project? Uh, you know, are we going to finish this by end of day? Or is this a multi-session project where we're actually going to be working on this continuously over the course of a month, a year? You know, maybe we're 10 people, we've got a huge project that we've got to accomplish, 
We may be meeting in multiple sessions, but we're going to need some breakout sessions. So who's going to work with whom? On what? By when? What are the checkpoints? Actually planning all this stuff out matters in what? Uh, when, how and when are we integrating the subtasks? Like if we have to break this down into subtasks, you know, me and two other people, we're all going to work on this part, and those three are going to go work on that part, and two here and two there. Well, that's, that's five different subtasks. How's that integrated? Who is doing the integrating? Who's coordinating this? If you've got a team leader, that team leader is probably doing the coordination. But in a lot of cases, you don't. Or your team leader is outside management. That person is not with you on the team. It's just the person you report to. In those cases, again, that's somebody running interference. But somebody's actually got to do the coordination on the team. And that there's a difference between the coordinator and the leader. So you have to differentiate that too. So somebody's job has got to be coordination. Or at very least, as a team, you've got to develop a coordination strategy. What's going to happen? Who's accountable for what? All of these things help determine how you make progress, whether you can make progress. In other words, it establishes a path for progress. So not only does everybody know what they're doing, when they're doing it, what their sub-deadlines are, what their sub-task deadlines are, but they know with whom they're interfacing, how their products are going to be interfacing with other people, how they know whether the stuff that they're working on is moving forward in Concord with the other stuff that's moving forward. But if you don't establish that, you're going to find people on very different timelines, with very different degrees of completion. And people are going to be sitting there uncertain as to what's supposed to be happening. Or, you know, well, we're, at, we're, on, we're on pace with this project, but they're not. And uh, now what are we going to do? We're going to sit and twiddle our thumbs for a week. Oh dear, this is frustrating, right? And this is when Frustration starts to build up, this is when fights start to happen, this is when politics starts to kick in, right? Any number of failings or any number of places where communication, coordination can break down. So try and establish it right off the bat. Try and figure out where the pitfalls are going to be. That, you know, this team is probably going to finish well before any other teams. So what are they going to do? How are they going to interface with the other teams? Maybe they should slow down. Maybe they have to be working on other things. Again, you can figure that all out early on to make sure that there's a clear path to progress at all times. And while we're on the subject of progress, we also need to get on the subject of accountability. Because you don't just need to know what you're supposed to get done, you need to know how that's going to be measured. If you're working on something, you ever, you ever thought about this, right? Especially, this, this happens the most to performance reviews, right? When you get a performance review, and you're being told, you did a good job, or you did a bad job, I had no idea I was getting measured on that job. I didn't know how I was getting measured on that job. I had no idea what the parameters were for being measured on this job. Uh, and all of a sudden, I've got a number next to my name, and I have no idea what that number means, right? And, but how often does this happen in teams also, right? You have, you have to produce something and they say, okay, that's good. Thanks. I, I'm not sure what good means here. I don't know whether I've done something right or I've done something wrong or people are happy with my performance or people are unhappy with my performance or I need to do something better or something else or I need to change this or that. How are you going to know? And it, you might notice that each of these things integrates with, with one another, going back to one of the questions I asked earlier, each of these things integrates with one another. But knowing whether you're doing a good job is a key part of progress. How are you going to get the feedback? How are you going to provide the feedback? Each piece has got to be good enough to fit in with the rest of what the team is producing. Again, we're all in the same boat, so we all got to be producing stuff of comparable quality. Let's define the standard. And this is especially important when you've got people at different levels, different abilities, different degrees of skill in the same room. How do you make sure that they're all accountable to a certain level? To what level should each subtask be held accountable? Or each group, or each team? How do you manage that? Not so simple. So the trick is, lay it out as a team, right from the get-go. Just start with that along with the other establishments of goals, process, those sorts of things. Get it out right away. And then in general, you've got to establish rules for talking the talk. I mean, egos exist. 
And there are going to be people on teams with egos. Get over it. You know, do not fret when you start running into egos on a team because all that's going to do is make the egos get bigger. Right? I mean, think about this, right? If you are worried about an ego, you're basically acknowledging that ego. You're effectively inflating that ego. You're basically pointing out, yep, that person's a threat. And the person who probably is the threat is going, sweet, I'm a threat. Puffs up, right? Get over it. And everybody's got to get over it. Because whether your ego is big or small or in the middle or flaming or ice or whatever else, Ship goes down, you go down with it. Project goes down, your ego isn't going to save you. So we're going to get over your ego, and you got to get over your ego because either the entire ship gets there or the entire ship doesn't. Consequently, there's got to be a commitment to this. We're all needed here. There's no two ways about this. And it's the funniest thing for people, and it's very hard for people to accept this, that we're all needed here. And no matter how many times you say this, inevitably, there's at least one person that hasn't quite gotten it through their head as quickly as you were hoping to understand we're all needed here. we are all got to do this together. Either the ship goes down with all of us on it, or the ship gets to wherever it's supposed to go with all of us on it. And that means we all have to listen. We need to be able to communicate, at least in this regard, we're all equals here, and we all need to be able to coordinate together. That means that if I'm working on a piece and I'm the most junior person in the room, well, guess what? I've got questions. And if I think something doesn't work, then I've got to, I've got to be able to ask, is this going to work? Is there, is there something wrong here? And it's often surprising. Who's got the one piece of information you needed? And I've found again and again that teams very rarely predict correctly where there's going to be a bottleneck, and who's got the key piece of information that's going to get you through it. So, if there's no commitment to listening to everybody, you're going to end up in that bottleneck, and somebody isn't going to speak up. And how many times have you encountered this, each of you, how many times have you encountered a situation where you suddenly go, my God, why didn't you say so? Right? That's what you're trying to avoid. You're trying to avoid the moment of, why didn't you say so? You knew! The whole time you knew this was going to work, why, why didn't you say anything? Uh, I wasn't sure I could say anything. I'm kind of the most junior person in the room. Gracious me, the, the, we, we just lost two weeks of work because you didn't speak up. Why didn't you speak up? Because I'm the most junior person in the room. And I didn't think anybody was going to listen. You probably all have all seen this at some point. Maybe because we're the most junior person in the room. Maybe it was the shyest person in the room. Maybe it was the foreign person in the room. We've got global teams now. Could be that somebody feels a little bit shy because their first language is not the first language of everybody else in the room, so they didn't want to say anything. You gotta encourage people to speak up. Another point is there are times for judgment and times not for judgment. Good team knows which is which. And you need to establish this. When the communication is um, is going in the room. You need to take a moment to say, you know, in this, at this moment we're just brainstorming. We're not judging ideas, we're not shooting down ideas, we just want to get as many ideas out as we can. This session is for brainstorming, so we don't judge now. This session is for judgment, now we're going to shoot down ideas. And you have to figure out when's which, but establish it as a rule. This period's for judgment, this period's not. Here we're throwing out ideas, here we're shooting down ideas. Here we're trying to expand our horizons. Here we're trying to narrow our focus. In each case, again, just establish it up front. And part of it is, the difficulty with this is nobody wants to say it. Right? Nobody wants to say, well, now we're going to shoot down ideas. Somebody has to say that. Somebody has to establish that now is a time for judgment. And everybody's got to buy into that judgment. And then it's a time for judgment. And yes, now we're going to judge. Now we need to judge. Because you've ever had this, you know, when, you, when people are just throwing out ideas and you know this isn't going to fly and you want to torpedo this and you don't, you're not going to say anything because everybody's going to say, oh, that's so judgmental. You're not even hearing through the idea. Well, yeah, but this idea is not going to work. But we need to hear more ideas, right? And when there's confusion about whether it's time to lay out ideas or time to judge, 
That's when things get difficult. That's when arguments start happening, and some people start going back and forth and saying, "Well, I, well, I, I don't appreciate you judging my idea. You know, I, I feel judged at the moment." Well, yeah, this is the time for judgment. No, we're just brainstorming right now, right? The, if you ever, I'm sure you've encountered this. With, with this, that confusion over whether we're brainstorming or whether we're trying to solve a problem. Some problem solving requires brainstorming. Some problem solving requires narrowing focus. I don't know which is which. So. I want to move a little bit from not just talking about how to make a team work at some of the basic levels, but rather at some of the higher levels. Now that we've got an idea of how to lay out the goals, how to organize, how to coordinate, how to make progress, how to establish um, shared meaning, shared goals, getting over the egos and all that sort of thing, that makes the team function. So that's good, we're up to function. How do we get the team to thrive? Let's move past functioning and into thriving. So let me ask you a question. Just on your own, think of an experience that fits these criteria. Something where it, it was probably challenging, but you were able to do it automatically. Like when you were doing it, it felt like it was effortless to do, despite it being very challenging. You probably got lost in it. You, you were very focused on it. So this was a challenging thing that you probably got lost in, and you just seemed to do it automatically. You knew exactly what to do. You love doing it. You're doing this just to do the activity. I mean, yeah, you know, great that there's a goal, but you're doing this just to be doing the activity itself. And maybe, maybe just maybe, you're doing what you do best. How many of you can come up with something that, an activity, any activity, at work or otherwise, that fits those criteria? How many people can come up with one of those? If you're having a little trouble with it, give it another second of thought. That's okay. A couple more people getting some ideas on this? All right, let me ask you one more question. Was it, in fact, one of the most enjoyable, rewarding, and engaging experiences you ever had? For most people, when they, the activity they come up with, the answer is probably yes. That's a flow experience. So this is work actually done by my advisor, Mike Chick sent me high, um, and I've done some work on this as well. A whole cadre of people doing research on flow. And what I want to suggest to you is that flow is possible at work. As a matter of fact, research shows that flow is most common and most frequent at work. And I'm going to bet, although I'm not going to ask anybody, that for at least some of you, the experience that you're thinking of happened at work. Maybe that's because you chose your profession for a particular reason, but even if not, a lot of times, flow happens at work. So why can't it happen with teams? Why can't it happen when you're doing the things that you love to do? When it's something you can totally get lost in? When it's challenging but comparable to your skills? Um, something that you can get totally lost in? And maybe the team can help you to maintain that focus. So all told, this is when a team effort goes from something that each, each individual needs to do, and yeah, you know, we're all on board with this, and yeah, we'll, we'll do it, and we can do it, we're coordinated, all that sort of thing, all the way up to, oh wow, I am loving this. And notice that basically as you take each of the points that I've laid out, some of the points of meaning and coordination and shared goals, as you take that to the next level, that's when you know what you need to do. You know whether you're doing it right. It's something that's aligned with your capabilities. It's going to be challenging, but you're up to the challenge. And because you're aligned with the goals, because you found meaning in it, it's something you can really dive into. It's something you can really put your efforts into. And you can actually enjoy the activity, since you've been assigned an activity, hopefully, that, it, that is at least in some alignment with your strengths and talents, which may be completely irrelevant from why you were there in the first place, but it aligns with your strengths and talents, suddenly you're able to really get involved in the activity and you're able to do your best. And when each person is able to do their best and derive that best from the dynamic of the team, this is what Chef Bounds and I call team flow. So let me give you an idea of what the characteristics of flow are just so you get some sense of what we're talking about here. And as I give you these ideas and these conceptions of flow come from research by, primarily by Csikszentmihalyi, think about how any given person's activity 
could have these characteristics. Now these first five, clear goals, immediate feedback, no fear of failure, distractions removed into balance of challenge and skill, and I'll get into this in a little more depth in a second. We call these the external conditions. These are created by the team dynamic. And as a member of the team, you're helping to create this dynamic not just for yourself, but for the rest of the team. Now the clear goals, that's easy. We've discussed that already. The immediate feedback has to do partly with the accountability. Knowing whether and how you are making progress and whether or not you're doing the right stuff. You realize you should have a sense of whether or not you're doing the right stuff, but the team can also give you some feedback to let you know, are you doing the right stuff? And that can be in accordance with the accountability guidelines that you've already set up. Now, no fear, this is actually kind of important because there needs to be a possibility that you can fail, otherwise nobody's going to bother. Nobody bothers when they can't lose. So there's got to be a chance of it, but you've got to not worry about it. You've got to stay focused, eyes on the prize. Now think about this, you know, as a team member, when somebody's losing focus, you can kind of remind them, eyes on the prize, eyes on our goal. We know what we're after. And consequently, you're removing the distractions. I mean, think about this, right? sometimes you get a little lost and a team member actually helps you get back on track, get back in focus, remove some distractions. And when the coordination's good, if you're having difficulty somewhere, one of the members of the team can actually remove the distraction of the difficulties for you. And in some cases, you know, you can have team members encouraging one another, kick it up a notch, put more skill into it, or alternately, you can get feedback that tells you, you know what, why don't you do something even harder than this? Pull off something better than that, you can do it. Right? And that ups the challenge to the level of skill that you've got. And in most flow experiences, the balance of challenge and skill, both the challenge level and the skill level are above your personal average for challenge and skill. So for you, it's challenging but you're up to it, but it's something that you'd consider difficult. Now what happens then, if you've got those five conditions, then the internal conditions are able to show up, and these are more emergent conditions. So one of them is the merging of action and awareness. The idea being that everything you're doing, everything that is on your plate or in front of you at that moment, every action you're taking, all consistent with the activity. So everything you're aware of is simply whatever you're working on. That has to do partly with the effortlessness of the flow experience, of feeling like you're in control, like you know what you're doing, you know what you've got to do, and the only thing that's on your mind is whatever's in front of you. It's a fantastic feeling. And you're not self-conscious. You're not, you know, working on a, you're not working on debugging a computer, pro a computer program going, how's my hair? Right? You're not worried about that. You're not worried about whether or not your boss is going to come by and pull a drive-by meeting on you or something along those lines. All you're, all you're worried about is what you're getting done. You're not worried about whether you look good getting done. You're not worried about an audience or anybody watching you. You're simply in your own space. And you get a distorted sense of time. Now, what's funny with that, a lot of people expect that time slows down for you. But actually, in some cases, time speeds up for you. Because uh, you ever had those moments like, where did the time go? That means that time kind of sped up for, for you or it slowed down for you. The time changes in some way. And uh, you know, some of my flow experiences, uh, I've gotten you know, just from playing volleyball. You know, as I'm watching, I play defense and I'm watching a spike come at me. And I can tell you, I know that there has to have been less than a second between when the attacker hit the ball and the time I'm touching the ball. Because that ball is going pretty fast. But it sure feels like several seconds to me, because I'm tracking the entire thing. I'm watching my side of the court. I'm watching their side of the court. I'm watching the attacker. I'm watching the ball. I'm watching the angles. I'm watching the movements. And if I'm going to have to touch a ball, that means that there are several people between me and the ball. You're watching all these things. And so in a certain sense, I'm not worried about whether it's 1,001, 1,002. I'm not checking my clock. And I'm not worried about who's watching me. I'm worried about what's happening in front of me. And the time can dilate or constrict you know, accordingly. Now, autotelic is important. Autotelic comes from autotelos self-goal. In other words, you're doing it just for the sake of doing it. And when I play volleyball, I mean, obviously, you know, me and my team, we're playing to win. But we're also playing to play. We want to play. We want to get in there and give it the best game we can. And that's what matters to us. And yes, our goal is to win. But winning is almost secondary to whether or not we've been able to get in there and give it the best game we can.
Now, as you guys probably have been able to grab your own activities that may fit these characteristics, or you've been able to think about how you're able to make these internal characteristics emerge for both yourself and the members of your team as you're engaged in the team activities, um, let me point out that that actually leads to improved performance. You've got a high focus. As you establish all these baseline aspects of the team, the goals, the accountability, the meaning, all those things, that helps you focus. And that clarity of goals and the clarity of the feedback, knowing exactly how you're going to get feedback, knowing whether or not you're going to be able to do it right, whether you're going to be able to make it progress, it actually leads to much higher performance. Because you're able to coordinate, you know what you need to get done. And incidentally, some of the research suggests that the works produced during a full experience are actually rated as higher quality and more creative. Part of the reason why is you're not worried about failure. You're not worried about people judging you. You're free to take the risks that you consider to be proper and reasonable. And sometimes you've got to do that. Sometimes you've got to go out there on a limb. And you've got to give it everything you've got, even though it may not be the most conventional way of doing things. But having that control means that you get better job satisfaction. You're more willing to engage in it. And by the way, it's a more meaningful experience. But the thing with that is, funnily enough, it's a two-way street, right? As you create meaning for yourself and for other people, so consequently they're having more meaningful experiences. But if the experience is actually meaningful, that's something you can dive into. The deeper you dive into it, the more you get a sense of the meaning of what you're doing. It becomes a virtuous cycle and a very helpful one at that. So with that in mind, let me shift this over to you guys and ask if there are any questions about this this far. So I'm going to continue the talk about team flow during the class, and the, uh, we're going to have some exercises and some further, deeper discussion about how we get into team flow. Um, but this actually just concludes the dinner portion of the talk, so let me ask uh, if people have questions about this. Yeah? One more question. So I, I work in drug development, and so one point that's interesting for me that I'm curious about is our goals are very long term. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it might take five years or six years or more to develop a job. So how do you deal with the fact that you don't have a goal that's, uh, you know, short term, and also the fact that team members might come in, and so like, you know, it's hard for them to maybe commit to a project only because you know they're only going to be on it temporarily. Um, so I guess my question is, how do you deal with that? What a goal that's long term? So in that case, I would say you probably end up with both teams and sub teams. Right, so your, your team, your team, there may be a core team of people that's on the five-year project, right? But then for each of the short-term projects, you're establishing basically a sub-team. That's a different group of people. It's a different team, it's a different set of people, and you really should treat it like a different set of people. And so basically start it again with the serious introductions, with all the coordinations that are there. And for some people, this may seem like a repeat, but you gotta remind the people that may be seeing a repeat of this that this is a different team. There are new people on this team, and that means there's a whole new dynamic, and it's a whole different boat. And even though we're all heading in the same general direction, there's a port that some people are getting off at, and we need to hit you know, certain things by the time we get to that port. And yeah, we have, I like, guess, a little bit of that Monday thing, because we have stages and milestones that we should and sometimes the members come in and out. So mm -hmm. I guess we just don't do the formal reintroduction of the team sometimes. But, so and the, but that's the thing, you've got to do that for every milestone. Every time a new member comes in, you got to treat this basically as a new team because you've got a new dynamic, you've got a new skill set coming in. So yeah, start again. Serious introductions, this is who we are, this is what we do. And tasks may shift. You may have somebody come in with a particular strength. Um, you know, at least you know, one of the teams I worked on, I happens to have done R&D also. Um, you, know, you get somebody coming in who's a really, really good chromatographer. Well, we have a chromatographer on the team. Yeah, but our new member of the team is a really, really, really good chromatographer, so let that new person do the chromatography. Our former chromatographer now has to do something else. Does that cover? Yes. Another question. I would also just, sorry to, yeah. I just went through this with the team. I would highly recommend creating a vision and a permission culture for that team. So when you do have new members come in, there's almost an onboarding process where you can say, here's the vision of the project, here's what we've established as our permissions for the culture, and give them a way to sort of prime them a little bit and then have them introduce the team. Because oftentimes when you have new members come in on a long project, which I work on quite a bit, 
you'll often find that people say, oh, that's a really cool team, I want to be part of it. And then they get into the situation, like you said, where they're, they're like, wait a second, this isn't what I signed on for. But if they have an awareness of that vision and what the culture of that team is, oftentimes you can help to find where your gaps are and maybe circumvent some of the challenges of bringing new people on and onboarding them. Yeah, and we do some of that too. We kind of, I mean, if we, if we can, like, have one-on-one with somebody but what you raise a point that I want to reiterate here is that you did some of that. Yeah, Got to do all of it. Because when it gets busy, when too many things are happening, then we kind of neglect some of these parts. And then we have right. somebody that's never been, been truly introduced to the team. And so we have this hybrid of people that are much closer to the core team and then you have members that are kind of building. And so the whole team. And I guess the problem for us is that the teams are huge. Mm -hmm. That's the other issue. Define huge here. 50 people. Yeah, that's not a team. That, that's almost I mean, like a so sub-company. So maybe 15 core members and then you know, everybody that participates. But again, every sub-team, every sub-team you got to go through this again. And you know, you're highlighting some of the main problems, that we have too many balls to juggle. We just don't have time for this. We can't get into that. You don't have time not to get into that. You've absolutely got to get into that. Because if anything goes wrong on the team, the project can fail. You don't have time for the project to fail either. You don't have the resources to run this project again from scratch if it fails completely. And in some cases, you know, if you're not trusting the members of your team, and actually I'll tell you one R&D project I was on, it partly got torpedoed because nobody was listening to one of the most junior members of the team who said something's going wrong with the assay, and everybody said to him, oh, you're just doing it wrong, you're just doing it wrong, and we lost about two weeks until somebody finally checked the reagents. One of the reagents had gone bad and had decomposed. And we lost two weeks on the project because nobody was willing to listen to the one person saying something's wrong. And we missed the fact that radiation decomposed. What happens when you get, I know we mentioned you have to trust your teammates, but what happens when you get people that do have a competitive edge to them, like you mentioned? Two people on the team do have similar skill sets, but mm -hmm. one feels that they're stronger in a certain area over the other one. Mm -hmm. How do you? I mean, how do you manage that and like work with delegation? So the question is, how do they? How are they each going to contribute to the shared goal of the team? And that's that's kind of how you break the competitiveness of this. Is that you know we're all in the same boat. We're all trying to get to the same place. So look, if you've both got the skills to do this, and we've only got room for one person to be doing this, you know. Try and decide amongst yourselves, but find out why that person's got a competitive streak. You know, is it that this person wants recognition for what they do? Well, fine. We will be very happy for whatever contribution you make. We will recognize you, and we will recognize it well, and we will make sure that you get lots of credit for the stuff that you've done for this team. You know, and that might be worthwhile also. It's just to create a gratitude session at the end, and possibly even a credit section at the end. Put a page of credits in the back if it's, if it's like a document or something like that. Put a page of credits, everybody's contribution. You know, the fantastic things that everybody's done on this team. And if, that, if you can't put that in as, as part of the external document, at least keep it as part of the internal document. So at least everybody in the company knows who did what, who did it well, who did a great job. That way, the, that way a competitive person is at least getting what they want, which is often, not always, often recognition. Is that covered? Steve. Yeah, um, I'm thinking about the Just because it's work, does that mean does that mean necessarily that it can't be enjoyable or that it can't be fun or that people can't love what they do and that the reason why they're getting paid is just the opportunity costs of maybe you know being able to loaf all day? Why why can't people have more flow experiences at work? I, I mean, you're asking why? I mean, I'm asking I mean, why not? It'd be great if they did, but, but what about what about tasks like the ones that have to put together the um, you know accounting budget or the uh, the um, Tax reports, you know, it's, uh... Some people find flow in doing that, and there can be challenges to it that people are doing. I mean, I will admit to you, not an accountant. Don't get why accountants like accounting. I know accountants who love accounting. I do not understand that at all, but that's probably why I don't do accounting. You know, it's interesting. There are several studies that show that, uh, that 
people who are high, more highly engaged actually work more and think they work less. Right. right. You know, again, I'm not, I'm not questioning this, but I mean, sometimes say you have a little company, you have to do these things even, mm -hmm. even if you don't like to do them. Yeah, definitely. So how do you, um, I mean, how do you kind of instill flow in a, in a situation where, where it's, it's not inherently going on? You know, I think you can't really match those conditions. Yes, that's an interesting question. I think, I think in a lot of cases, flow is not inherently. Um, or at least there's no activity per se. I mean, some of my research, some of Chicksemi High's research, we pretty much figured out that any activity can be a flow activity. The question is whether or not people are able to do that. Uh, in Chicksemi High's 97 book, Finding Flow, he pointed out that uh, there are even people in the manufacturing industry who are doing the same repetitive tasks like every single day, and they manage to gamify it for themselves. Like one, one particular case he talks about, somebody who just manages to gamify it for himself. Can I do it, you know, in, can I do this task in five seconds? And yesterday I managed to do it in 501, can I get it down to 459? And you just see people doing stuff like that. And they're, and they're able to find flow in that by basically creating their own challenges out of it. So acknowledging that everyone can find flow mm -hmm. and the assertion that everyone will find flow being different, what do you do on those teams when people are either unwilling or unmotivated to go that extra mile to achieve it? And how do you deal with their perhaps lack of effort or uh, as you would deem it? Mm -hmm. So it, when I encounter that situation, the first question I want to ask is, why aren't you in this? We, why, why? Just a paycheck. Just a paycheck? I just want to go home and watch TV after. Uh, okay, delightful, you're off the team. Well, but then that's a penalty for being honest about what my goals and motivations are from the beginning. Not necessarily, because if you didn't want to be on the team in the first place, you can go back to your cubicle. And you can go tell management you need somebody else. But in, in other cases like that, what you can say is, uh, you know, if you like your paycheck so much, you want a bigger one? You know, if I, I mean, that person basically said, my motivation is my paycheck. Fine, you want a bigger one or do you want a smaller one? You torpedo this, we all go down. That means you don't get your paycheck and you may get terminated. Or if this works out well, you get a larger paycheck and you might be able to get to your television set earlier in your life if you wish to. So again, you know, even those people, they're motivated by something at least. You know, this person wants their television and they want their paycheck. Fine, hit them there. E either way, either get them off your team or the paycheck is the game. Fine, do your best on this because you might be in a better position to get a raise if you do well on this, same as the rest of us. Is that work? Yes, thank you. Okay. Perfect. Uh, a lot of what you're saying involves people being like honest, like people aren't really at least gonna readily admit their agenda as like something they're not good at if they're saying that they're good at. How do you get people to pick it up? So the suggestion I make is we're all in the same boat here. So if you're not going to be open and honest about this, if we're all playing with a whole bunch of unknowns, then we're, uh, forgive the expression, we're living in a power keg and giving off sparks. Uh, this is, that, that's not going to work for people, and that's not going to work for everybody on the team. Because if we don't all have honest and open communication here, there's a very real possibility that we're going to get nailed by something we currently can't see. Then we all go down, you included. So everybody talk, everybody say something because whatever you're keeping from us here, whatever you're not willing to be honest and open about, as uncomfortable as that's going to be, you know, believe you us that it's going to be even worse if things go down or if we don't perform at the level that we're supposed to or the level that we're hoping to. So that often, that often opens a lot of mouths. Granted, it's not going to do it every time. And there are always going to be exceptions to this rule. And when that happens, you know, bottom line, you just got to do damage control. If you if you got people on that team that you think are shy or that you think are not, you know, going to get out there, you might want to try just using the grapevine. If one or two people can, you know, just approach that person. If you sense that, and you know, again, you know, use use your sense, use your eyes, use your ears. If you think somebody's not opening up about something, there's probably a good reason why not. Maybe they don't feel like they're in the same boat. Whatever it is, um, if you have a leader on the team, that may be the leader's job. Otherwise, uh, somebody on the team is concerned, or somebody, maybe in many cases, not everybody notices, so the person that noticed, go talk to them. See what's going on. Why are they not aligned? Why are they not worried about going down with the ship? 
And why aren't they going to be honest about it? Because that lack of honesty is going to be very damaging. Does that make sense? Okay, well, I think that's going to have to terminate the public portion of the talk. Thanks, uh, Mark. <laughs> Team Flow and Jeff Bosenhout, and we actually, again, completely unintentionally wore the same outfit uh, on one day at a conference in Europe. So we took that picture. That is our team picture working on Team Flow, and a whole bunch of other people that have given us comments and feedback on this research, including uh, Matthew Begelman, Bob Ulrich, uh, Jan Barakin, Don Anderson, Mike Chick sent behind Gina Kamura, and Kara Snow. So thanks to all of them as well. Thanks.